Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today, we'll be talking about a recent collaboration between uh, Forum One and Mercy Corps on a project to improve the performance of MercyCorps.org. Uh, we, we hope you'll leave today with some insights on uh, site performance concepts, uh, how performance can be measured, and how it may influence user conversion. Uh, just a quick introduction. My co-presenter is uh, the lead user experience designer at Mercy Corps, uh, Drew Betts. Uh, and my name is John Brandenburg. I'm a developer at Forum One and a member of our dedicated support team. Uh, this is the business showcase session for Forum One. Uh, and we're talking about the site speed project because it came out of our, uh, our support work for Mercy Corps. Uh, just a little bit about Forum One. Uh, we focus solely on working with mission-driven organizations that uh, are working to make great changes in this world, like Mercy Corps. Uh, our full service agency provides uh, digital strategy, design, uh, development, and ongoing support services, uh, which provide long-term strategic support, development, uh, fully managed hosting, uh, and, and uh, now to tell you a little bit about Mercy Corps, who they are and what they do, I'm going to turn, that, uh, turn this over to Drew. Cool. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Mercy Corps is, we're a global humanitarian aid organization. We were founded 36 years ago in response to uh, the refugees that were fleeing the war and famine in Cambodia. And since then, we've helped uh, 170 million people in 115 different countries survive emergencies and uh, build back better. So when natural disasters strike, uh, like the 7.9 magnitude earthquake that hit Nepal uh, on April 25th, Mercy Corps responds to meet urgent needs for water, food, and shelter. Uh, some of you may also know that uh, two days ago, a second earthquake hit Nepal, this time 7.3 mag magnitude, causing uh, even more destruction. So after the crisis, Mercy Corps stays and partners with the local communities uh, to help them rebuild. And um, this is one of my favorite uh, pictures. And this is a young man in a Mercy Corps carpentry program in Helmand Province, Afghanistan. Uh, so you might be asking yourself, well, what does site speed have to do with Mercy Corps? Well, our website is uh, critical for us in engaging uh, visitors as well as raising funds for our efforts. And so last year, I was uh, just kind of doing some testing on the site, and I noticed that it loaded really slowly on uh, my phone. So I got to uh, researching uh, site speed and... The first place that I landed was a free site. This is webpagetest.org. You can uh, give it a URL, even specify a browser and connection speed, and uh, it runs a report, and, uh, or it runs a test and then comes back with a report. So you can see, uh, or maybe you can't because it's really small, uh, we had a load time of 4.8 uh, seconds. Uh, this is a desktop connection using uh, IE9 on a cable modem. I thought, well, you know, that's tolerable. It's not great. Webpagetest.org also gives you a letter grade for various other uh, site metrics and even links to, uh, underneath those to help you improve. And you can see that we had a lot of room for improvement. So if desktop was bad, uh, mobile was worse. It was much worse. Uh, we had a load time of 19 seconds uh, for an iPhone. And... I could just picture people giving up uh, um, when they were trying to come to our site uh, before they even got there. Uh, there the uh, web page test doesn't give a letter grade for the uh, mobile tests. Oh, sorry. Thank you. So it turns out that uh, slow site speed can have a negative effect across a, a number of different aspects of your site. And uh, the first is if you're an e-commerce site or your uh, site like ours is your conversion rate. And this is a slide from a study that Walmart did in 2012. Actually, I should say it's an initiative that Walmart did in 2012. That red line is the conversion rate, and those blue bars are the load times. And uh, for every one second of improvement in load time, they experienced up to a 2% increase in conversions. And for every 100 milliseconds of improvement, incremental revenues grew by up to 1%. So they also found that increased load times uh, also had increased bounce rates and decreased revenues. And for somebody, as you can imagine, like Walmart at their size and scale, this, uh, just improving a little bit had a tremendous impact. Now, you all might be wondering how Walmart and Mercy Corps are related. Well, they're not, uh, but 
there really isn't any research out there that I could find that looked at uh, the conversion rate for uh, nonprofits like Mercy Corps and Sitespeed. So we're kind of, kind of off on our own here. So as I mentioned, there are other negative effects to, to slow site speed. It lowers, uh, it negatively impacts your SEO. If you have a slow site, Googlebot can't crawl um, more of it. Uh, we know that uh, at least since 2010, uh, early 2011, that Google has used site speed as part of their page ranking algorithm. Uh, it lowers perceived quality and credibility. Uh, so when users come to your site, uh, it, it's, it's gonna detract from that. Frustrates users. I think we can all relate to uh, going to slow sites and, and uh, of course, increases bailout rate. So we've site, slow sites is a problem, and uh, we had uh, we needed to improve. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to John to talk about uh, what to do about it. Uh, thanks, Drew. Uh, so you know who Mercy Corps and Forum One are, uh, and why we're so interested in site speed. Uh, let's talk about what site speed is anyway, and how we measure it. Uh, we have a few different metrics that we use here uh, when we talk about site speed. Uh, first is page load time. This takes, uh, well, as you might expect, measures how long it takes to load a page uh, with all referenced assets. Uh, this also includes any th uh, third party scripts that aren't perceptible to the user. So a page that might take 15, might appear to load in under two seconds, actually might take 15 seconds, but uh, this is, it can be okay because it's all about the user experience. Uh, next, what we call it is time to first byte. Uh, this t measures the time that passes from when a request is sent to a site to when you begin receiving data for that uh, page. Uh, this is a pretty critical value uh, since it blocks downloading all their assets on the page so it can uh, uh, really make a difference. Um, the third measure we talk about is start render. Uh, this refers to how long it takes requests to uh, process before a user actually begins seeing uh, the page rendered on there on their browser. Uh, so this is actually a pretty complex subject, uh, and there are a lot of different drivers of these values. Uh, some we have more control of than others, and to a couple of the items you see on, uh, crossed out on this list. Uh, you could say like you know, a CDN or something could, could counteract that, but I'm just gonna say we don't have much, much control over this. Uh, I'm not gonna go through each of these, and this isn't a comprehensive list, uh, but I will call out caching and downloading assets as some uh, items that we have control over in, on a Drupal installation. Uh, so, there are a, few, are a few important things you need out of the tools uh, you use to measure performance, uh, something to analyze the page structure and behavior uh, of your page, uh, as well as how optimized your assets are, and how if your images are compressed, if your CSS or JS are, are, are well optimized. Uh, also, something that can perform load testing, so simulating large amounts of traffic that are visiting your site. Uh, and here are the, te the tools that we used. Uh, you already saw the slide Drew showed you earlier from webpagetest.org. Uh, they had a REST API that we utilized, and uh, it uh, allowed us to script these uh, tests. Uh, it was a good tool for that. They also provide videos of your page actually rendering. Uh, Google PageSpeed is great. Uh, gives you a, a rating uh, and separates it out from desktop and mobile. Uh, it, it seems to place an emphasis on payload size overall. Uh, Apache Benchmark is great for simulating heavy loads uh, on a server and already comes packaged with any Apache web server installation. Uh, we all also utilize the page for service New Relic. Uh, New Relic provides a, a wealth of data on a live pr running production instance. Uh, and also Google Analytics to uh, assess user engage engagement, which we'll define for you and explain uh, how we measured that in a bit. Uh, for the future, I consider using a tool called JMeter. A lot of my colleagues recommended uh, this. Uh, organizes a lot of similar tools in in a fashion that allows you to uh, organize your actual test runs. Because we found that uh, sifting through the mountain of data that we collected was quite a challenge in of itself. Uh, but regardless, uh, in effort to to uh, make these tests more consistent, I wrote a script which I posted on GitHub. Uh, also, the user engagement script was uh, done through uh, Google Tag Manager, and uh, it's, the source was through this article you see, uh, and we'll be making these slides available online later. Uh, so we have our instruments, uh, and uh, what we have to do, had to do was come up with a consistent way to apply them uh, beyond just scripting it. So Drew will walk us through that. So 
So when we started this project, it was really important that we have a consistent process to follow because we wanted to show the, the impact of our efforts. So first we decided uh, on the metrics and the tests. Then we decided on the changes that we were going to, to make and we prioritized them. And the changes were uh, when for prioritizing were based on the perceived amount of impact that they would have as well as the level of effort required to make them. Before we did any of the changes, we did uh, baseline testing on our staging and production servers. Uh, then we had developed and applied each of the changes, measured them in staging and production, and repeated the process. So, uh, some kind of some general notes. Where we could, we tried to simulate as closely as possible the experience of our users coming to the site. So, use the same mobile browser, use the same desktop browser. Um, we didn't use any virtual machines. These yield uh, inconsistent results uh, when you're doing uh, testing, and so we kept the staging and production environments as identical as possible. The big exception to this is load balancing. Uh, we at Mercy Core load balance our production servers, and load balancing staging servers would be, well, it was going to be just too uh, uh, time and cost prohibitive. So metrics, uh, John's going to cover this, so I'll quickly go through um, page load speed. We've talk, uh, he talked about that. Conversion rate, uh, we're defining conversion rate as the number of visitors who came to the site divided by the number of the visitors who made a donation. And if your site is encouraging users to take some other action, that will be you know, your conversion rate. Engagement rate is a new metric. We wanted to see if by increasing the speed of the site that people who are coming to our article section would read more articles. Would they make it farther down the article that they were reading? Would we see a lower bounce rate? And that's where that uh, Google Tag Manager script uh, it, that John talked about came in. You can see it over there on the, uh, on the right, so it, it basically fired off all of these events, and you could see these in Google Analytics. And the last was response time, uh, synthetic measurement in Apache of how many requests that the web server could handle and how fast that it could respond to those requests. All right, so we get the measurements, we have the process, what to improve. Thanks, Kendrew. Uh, we identified a number of items uh, to improve on the site, uh, but before we go through that, though, I just uh, when we're talking about site speed in Drupal, I feel obligated to uh, call these items out uh, to any uh, person who manages the Drupal site. And if that's you, take note, go check your site after the session or after the next session. Uh, the page cache is, is really simple normally. Uh, it you know, saves your page and, and, and reuses it for, for all users. It can get tricky, as we'll see in a moment, because uh, we ran into a, a bug with this uh, on Mercy Core. Uh, next item is compressing, compressing your in, uh, CSS and JS. Uh, uh, since your browser can only download between five and eight things at any one time, you want to minimize the number of things you have, so uh, that leads to better performance overall. Uh, on the same admin panel, you see the, the, what's called the block cache. If you uh, are unfamiliar with uh, this, uh, the, the caching in the block cache can be a bit dumb sometimes, so uh, do be careful when using this. It, it can uh, lead to issues where you see uh, dynamic blocks uh, uh, repeating uh, in areas where you don't expect. Uh, if you're unsure on how to do this or want to see some actual quantified data on what these can do, uh, I have a blog post on forum1.com. Uh, getting back on track to mercycore.org. Uh, we identified a, a, a first set of changes which ended up being caching all around. Uh, we chose these because we believe that they would have a, a low uh, level of effort for the impact that they would provide. Uh, first, we enabled views caching on a number of uh, views across the site. Uh, this was going to be an easy win and only required a simple configuration change on each view. Uh, the page cache is normally a simple option, uh, but we're seeing some unusual behavior around when users are being served cached pages. So we wanted to dig into this a little further. Uh, and memcache is a popular option uh, as an alternative backend cache. And so we wanted to set this up because it's uh, rather simple to set up. Uh, the first uh, change we made was enabling the views caches, uh, uh, which allows us to cache many of the individual elements that make up the page. Uh, this is uh, pretty straightforward to change. Uh, for example, uh, but it can lead to issues with cross cache contamination. So, for example, a lot of the uh, country pages on MercyCore.org uses the open layers uh, based uh, display mode, which displays uh, maps uh, on, for the country. 
Uh, but we ran into an issue where if you visited, uh, say, the Afghanistan page, you'd see the map of Afghanistan. Uh, if you went to the Nigeria page afterwards, you'd still see the map of Na Afghanistan. So we couldn't use uh, views caching for, for open layer based views. Uh, we also added the views content cache module. Uh, this handles uh, cache expiration for views based on when uh, similar content types are updated. Uh, and this is helpful for uh, keeping our lists of content up to date. Uh, the result of the views caching showed a pretty modest improvement, which is what we expected. Uh, it's also good to note, though, that the uh, s impact of your views cache will uh, correlate with the complexity and amount of data you're displaying in your view. Uh, just a quick explanation of the charts you're seeing. Uh, these come from the Apache Benchmark uh, tool. Uh, it provides an option to output a CSV file. Uh, they show the number of requests served under a specific time uh, for that percentage. So 20% uh, of requests were served in three and a half seconds or less. 80% uh, of requests were served on uh, 3.8 seconds or less. Uh, this is uh, across 1,000 requests each. On the left you see uh, a level for uh, 10 users concurrently and a level for 50 users concurrently. Uh, admittedly, to properly test this, we need to have the page cache disabled. So no under normal conditions, you wouldn't see such a uh, a large uh, jump up to the 50 users. If you can't read that, uh, the scale is uh, quite different, about um, five times that of the uh, chart on the left. I uh, probably should make those proportional. Um, next, we're seeing inconsistencies with the page cache, and uh, we just had to address that next. Uh, I previously mentioned that this is uh, uh, typically a simple thing to do on a Drupal site. Uh, however, in the case of Mercy Corps, uh, cache pages were being served radically, and we just needed to dig into the code. And it turned out that uh, use of the, the session global variable uh, was being uh, made. And what this does is it will create a session for a user, regardless of whether or not they're logged in or not. This is actually the, the well, all logged in users have sessions, but uh, sessions for anonymous users uh, cause the Drupal page cache to not serve those uh, pa cache pages. So uh, we went through and uh, provided some alternative means to uh, serve this, uh, store these session variables. Uh, we used cookies instead and implemented that. Uh, we also suggested that Mercy Corp uh, change their cache lifetime from five minutes to an hour. Now this resulted in more stable caching behavior. Uh, we're tracking to see. You might argue you get 200 from cache. But, uh, I'm also going to jump into the next measure we implemented, uh, which was setting up the memcache module. Uh, this is an alternative caching mechanism and is much faster than the default database cache. Uh, and uh, one module that complements memcache well is the uh, entity cache. Uh, this module, uh, as you could have guessed, caches entities like nodes, uh, which helps improve the performance across many areas of a Drupal site. Uh, in simulated testing, uh, mean time the first byte went from four and a half seconds to 1.5 seconds on the Mercy Court donation page. Uh, and as a follow-up to the test reports Drew mentioned, uh, load time dropped by about 50% to 2.3 seconds. Uh, the time first byte dropped uh, about 65% to uh, 0.35 seconds. Uh, and all these measures were ready uh, just in time for a serious event that's still unfolding right now. Uh, which was the aftermath of the 7.8 magnitude earthquake uh, that struck Nepal. Uh, Mercy Corps has uh, the largest, one of the largest humanitarian teams in the country and is in a unique position to bring aid to the people affected in the region. Uh, so these measures were ready just in time, uh, or nearly ready just in time when this tragedy happened. Uh, over the course of that weekend, uh, the Form 1 and Mercy Corps teams uh, worked to uh, adequately test these changes and push them directly to production. Uh, uh, at the same time, the Mercy Corps team also set up mercycorps.org to use a, a content delivery network or a CDN. Uh, when disasters like these gain international media attention, uh, people uh, desire to help and pour into uh, organizations like mercycorps.org through their public websites. and. So these fundraising platforms need to be ready to handle this type of traffic. Uh, anecdotally, the Mercy Corps team noted that they used to sweat when they had 400 users on the site, but now they welcome them with open arms. 
here you see that da daily Google Analytics report uh, starting on the April 24th, the day before the earthquake, uh, through May 9th, uh, when traffic peaked at 116,000 visitors. Uh, this is the new relic report after the last deployment. Uh, the markers indicate uh, when the deployment happened, and which led to a much more stable system, as you can see from the flatter lines. Uh, and this slide shows the impact of the content delivery network. Uh, this is the number amount of data that's being fed out of the CDN. Uh, and yeah, so at, actually uh, at uh, that high point there on April 30th, uh, uh, Amazon served uh, 23.7 gigabytes of uh, data for us and that uh, took that load off of our servers. Um, and uh, that was thanks uh, in part to the CDN module. Um, I'm going to probably not say his name right, but uh, Vim Lears. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, so did our, uh, our site speed efforts have an, imp an impact uh, uh, for our desktop and mobile users. So here's the desktop before, up above, and here it is down before. This is uh, same IE9 using the cable modem connection. Uh, we shaved 1.3 seconds from load time, uh, six, uh, 0.648 seconds from first byte, uh, 0.744 seconds from start render, and visually complete, we shaved uh, an entire 6.4 seconds off of load time. Which is, which is great. Uh, our letter grades improved. Uh, so we still have some work to do on compressing images. That's uh, it's gonna be some of the next work that we do. And we got a, a, an F for cache static content. And that uh, I think is a little unfair because we have a number of third party scripts that load after the main content loads and we can't do anything about that. Um, for mobile, so there's the before up there. And then afterwards, uh, impact, we shaved 2.89 seconds off of load time and uh, 2.51 seconds off of start render. Uh, and WebPage test, this is, is a little, I think a little odd. It says that visually complete, we didn't uh, save any time, uh, but uh, I can tell you by looking at the videos, we definitely did. Uh, so we would have liked to present to you today a, a longitudinal study where we were able to say, well, you know, we made these changes, we would wait long enough until we had enough evidence and make another set of changes and then test against the previous changes, but uh, the, the earthquake uh, kind of changed all of that. Uh, so what I did is I went back and I looked at the last uh, major emergency that Mercy Corps responded to, which was Typhoon Haiyan in November of uh, 2013, and I took a similar 15-day block uh, around that event. So uh, up above there is um, the, uh, uh, the, the top line in the graph is Haiyan, and then below is uh, the earthquake. And uh, we were uh, improved across the board uh, compared to Haiyan. And, uh, and admit, it's not a fair evaluation, but it's the best that we could, you know, the best that we could do. Um, as far as uh, when, when we rolled out the content engagement script on April 1st, uh, we had enough time to at least form a little bit of a baseline. So uh, this time, since we had the script in place, uh, I did a comparison between during the emergency versus uh, the April 1st, uh, the, the kind of the baseline for it. And uh, actually, uh, surprise, <laughs> it, uh, yeah, we, it, we were down. Um, a little flat, actually, uh, in terms of the engagement, not um, you know, just a 5% uh, difference uh, for our article section, but that was kind of a surprise. <coughs> and then lastly, uh, conversion rate. Um, so there is the conversion rate that we saw in the Nepal uh, earthquake. And in the middle there is the baseline. So compared to high end, we were up uh, by 3%. For desktop, 1% for tablet, and 2.6% uh, for mobile. And then against the baseline, uh, and that baseline, I don't know, I didn't talk about this before, that was all of last year. I, uh, because we have a lot of seasonal traffic, I just took an entire year of uh, uh, website traffic and uh, created a baseline. So we were up compared to that, 5.5 um, for tablet, 2.83 for desktop, and 3.1 for mobile. So we're not done yet, and uh, yeah, John. Uh, 
Yeah, uh, we'd like to continue our work with Mercy Corps. Uh, uh, the graph here you see is uh, sort of the ideal uh, framework you'd like to, or stack you'd want set up with a, a Drupal site with uh, some sort of reverse proxy cache sitting in front, like Varnish, uh, another CDN, and then uh, going down to your, your Drupal site. Uh, so uh, a few more items we want to implement. Uh, this is an ongoing project, uh, and and it, but so far we've, we've managed to make some very significant improvements to the site speed of Mercy Corps. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have another session starting in, in a few minutes here. Uh, I guess we have about five minutes. Uh, but if, if we have any quick questions, we can take those. But we'll probably take the bulk of questions out in the hall after uh, this next session. So. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you. Can you make available the, uh, the GitHub repo? It is available. Oh, yeah. no, I meant Oh, uh, yeah, we'll post these slides online. It's, it's under my GitHub account name, John Bieberg. Yeah. All right, uh, so I think we're the second half of this, so um, thanks for coming. My name is Jason Ford, CTO of Black Mesh. Um, Solomon Gifford, uh, he's uh, one of our DevOps engineers. Uh, this is the first time we've actually bit, did this demo in front of someone. It's going to be a live demo, so hopefully it works. It's the, yeah, exactly. Cross the fingers, the toes, you know, sacrifice a few chickens. Um, you know, we're going to see if it actually works out. But we're, what we're going to try to show is uh, a tool that we've been working uh, probably over the last three years or so. We've been uh, doing a lot of dev, DevOps work and workflow. Um, so what we basically came up with is a more standardized way of doing this instead of just doing it one-offs per customer. So we created this thing called Cascade. Um, and what, what it basically becomes is a, a workflow deployment tool that is flexible for what you want to do instead of having to just do only Drupal or only WordPress or only Node. It can basically do any of these things that is allowed to do Git and actually have an SSH connection to go into that box. So it's not really just pointed at one simple thing because most sites just don't only have Drupal or only one, one thing. They're using other things as well, Angular JS or something like that, that may or may not be impactful to, to what you're trying to push into. So, you know, the first thing is that we always get asked, why, why is it so hard to do dev workflow, right? So, I mean, every, there's a thousand different ways to do it. Um, you know, none of them are really wrong as long as they work for what you're trying to do. But the problem is that you have to have a certain skill set, right? So you have to be a developer and you have to also be operational at the same time because certain things that you make decisions on may impact the, the site uptime, you know, and those things then impact SEO scores and impact other things as well. But you have to have it. Right, so if you don't have the, you know, whether it's you manually going into the box and actually typing commands, or whether something else is actually doing those things for you, uh, you still have to have something that says I need to deploy code from here to here to here, or a database, you know, as you go from different stages, whether it's development, whether it's staging, or whether it's production. So, and, and that flexibility was what I was kind of talking about before. Is you know, you don't not not at any time do you have one technology you're dealing with. You know, most most shops will pick the right tool for the right thing. So. Maybe Drupal isn't the right thing, or maybe it is. Um, but you want to have that flexibility and then have, hopefully, that same workflow logic happen around that. You know, dev and sysadmins always fight, right? So we're always, you know, developers always have this, this thing saying that sysadmins are always the ones causing the problems. Sysadmins always say the network guys are causing the problems. The network guys always say, you know, the communication guys are always causing the problems. You know, it's this line of, of contention that's always there. So trying to add these things together, that's, that's the problem. You know, that's the problem space that we're trying to, trying to at least help with a little bit. So Cascade stands for this. Uh, basically, customer administrated, uh, administered system configuration and automated deployment engine. Um, very long. Um, but basically, what, what we came up with is we have this interface that is the front end to uh, Jenkins, GitLab, and uh, Ansible in the back end. So we basically have written this, this application as a node front end. Um, that basically gets your uh, requests and then pushes things around dependent upon what you tell it to do. So this demo setup we're going to do today, um, we have basically four Vagrant servers that we're, we're running uh, on this laptop. So one's the Cascade server itself um, that basically we have all of our tools on that we've built, um, and that's our workflow engine. And then we use Red Hat OpenShift for development. So anybody that doesn't know what OpenShift is, it's basically an automation platform as a service um, the Red Hat's created. It's you can get both the free version, which is Origin, or you can get the enterprise version, which is 
more geared towards you know JBoss and other things other than just PHP containers. Um, the second one for staging, we use Docker. Uh, we basically spin up a Docker container with Drupal inside that. And then we have two uh, KVM virtual instances that are running production to show that we can deploy to multiple front ends um, instead of just having you know just one one place to dump this code. In a real world setup, you know, we might have physical servers. You know, in our cases, you know, we we see a lot of people with physical, virtual. Maybe it's not even in our in our network. It could be outside. At the end of the day, what we're what we're after is you just have to have SSH. So as long as you have SSH, we can attach to those things. Um, you know, it could be a container. It could be really anything that you want to want to have that that piece into. So with that, I'm basically going to turn it over to Solomon. He's going to kind of walk through some of the deployment uh, techniques and stuff that you need to talk about whenever we're talking about workflow, and then discuss some of those pieces of this puzzle, and then actually do the demo itself. So, all right, so in a normal uh, development workflow, um, you have code that you work on your local laptop, you push that into your Git repo, um, you want to put that onto your dev environment, you push that to staging, and then eventually, once the customer has accepted that, you push it to your production environment. The database, on the other hand, except for when you're um, you know, first deploying a site brand new, the database goes the other direction. You want to take a live uh, database and pull it down to your staging, and um, if, if at all possible, bring that down to your development as well. And um, you know, a lot of times on Monday morning or every couple of weeks on a Monday morning, um, it might be your job or someone within your office's job to to you know to do all those database dumps and get uh, get staging back up or get in, get um, um, get dev ready for development. And um, you know we saw a, a need for this to be automated. It's something that's repeatable, something that it's something that um, is done all the time. So we wanted to to solve that problem. Um, obviously, there's exceptions to this workflow. So sometimes. Um, uh, you might have multiple dev machines, so uh, you might have different branches that you're working on. Um, uh, you might have two staging machines because you're also doing load balancing in your staging environment. Um, and of course, multiple productions uh, that is in our demo today. We have two vagrant boxes you know, representing two uh, staging, I mean two productions, but of course this could be 11 web heads or whatever your, your scenario may be. Um, so we have this normal uh, workflow um, for code going upstream, uh, databases coming downstream, but Cascade doesn't just only support those directions, but yes, you can restrict within the interface through permissions so that um, you don't want to accidentally push your staging code to production once you go online. So I know this graph um, might seem a little confusing at, at, at first, but um, here you are, you and other developers. Um, you commit changes into some into some repo. So we provide uh, an installed GitLab as part of our solution. And if you're not familiar with GitLab, think GitHub only. It's open source, and you can install it on a box. And so, as part of the Cascade solution, we ins we we give you a VM that has Cascade and, um, and GitLab and some of the other tools all installed on the box already. You don't have to set this up. We set it up for you. So the first thing is, like I said, GitLab. So think GitHub only. Um, it's installed locally um, within your within your environment, and um, all the Git commands work. It's, it's a, it, you know it's Git clone um, to get your code down, Git push to, to push it back up. So we have our source control, and what we want to happen when we push our code into the repo is we want it to automatically pull the dev. Uh, you want to be able to see your changes immediately or you know within a few seconds live on the server so you can test it essentially in a real environment. And uh, this in this scenario or in this picture you see the guy Jenkins, that's that's the official Jenkins logo. So um, Jenkins queues up the task to actually deploy um, the code from Git into the dev environment. Um, the feedback loop that you see here going around the edge um, we don't set this up for you, but we, sh we give you access to set it up. You can set up feedback loops to send emails, to hook into your hip chat or IRC so that you can know when that has happened, so that your whole team can know every time um, dev has been updated with the latest code. Um, and then finally, um, uh, we want to deploy that code in this, in this model. So Jenkins is, is pointing over to this big A. A stands for Ansible. 
Um, Ansible is a, um, an automation uh, framework. And um, you, you create roles, you create tasks. And um, I'm not going to go deep into, into Ansible at this point. But um, to suffice it to say, we, over, we, um, we inherited the, the, the runner class of the, of the Ansible. Um, um, open, well, Ansible is an open source project. We, we, um, we inherited the, uh, the runner class and created our own wrapper. And this wrapper then essentially can log into your dev and your staging and your production and deploy the code into the right places. And um, so that's, generally speaking, all the pieces in the pu of the puzzle. There is one more piece that's not on this. Uh, we also um, have install LDAP so that you can have permissions management, create users, remove users, et cetera, reset your password, et cetera, all as part of this. Um, it's very configurable. Um, so we can do more environments than just uh, dev staging and production. Um, multiple web heads, I already talked about that. Um, if you're familiar with GitHub, you know that you can put things into groups. Um, you can create a, um, well, your user is, is the, your default group, but you can also create essentially a company and that becomes like a group. So you can create groups. And uh, GitLab supports the same, the same concept, concept. And so in our Cascade interface, we have this concept of, of a group as well. Um, this helps you so that, especially with permission management, so that you can have multiple sites in the same group and um, give your different developers access to different sites. And um, of course, it supports not just Drupal, um, it also supports non standard Drupal sites. So, as long as your code can be deployed, um, then Cascade, Cascade can work with it. Um, Cascade knows how to deploy Git and it knows how to uh, move databases around. All right, so at this point, I'll show you a little bit of a demo. Sacrifice your chickens, please. <laughs> so hopefully this does not need any internet connection because, uh, again, it's running as on, on Vagrant on this box. Um, that said, I did have Vagrant crash for me the other day, and it took me 20 minutes to, to get it all back up. So hopefully that doesn't happen today. Um, all right, so when you first come in to... Um, so this, you see actually the, the dashboard. I'm going to actually go to the dashboard here. And obviously, we're having a little bit of um, a display issues with this resolution. Um, this actually is mobile, um, uh, mobile compliant. So if I, had, if I, uh, if I use a different uh, resolution here, the uh, stuff on the right-hand side will drop down below. But anyway, you can see that we have this concept of a group. And so our sites are going to be in the groups. We also see on the right-hand side the different machines that are in uh, in your um, uh, in your environments. So in this case, we have a development box, two production boxes, and a staging box. And there's information about those. So for example, um, we have the domain name and the IP address, and a description. Uh, you also notice that we uh, give you the option to restart services from um, on each of those machines. This doesn't just have to be Apache and MySQL. We also support uh, uh, Redis, Memcache, or whatever services uh, you want. Um, we can restart uh, you know, SSHD if you wanted us to. <laughs> um, you also see a workflow log. So these are the things that other people have been doing. So you can see the blame here. Is, is, in these examples, it's um, our demo account. But it could be you know, your developers. All right, so we'll select a group. So we created a group here at DrupalCon. In it, we have two sites, um, and I'll show the um, the Drupal 8 demo. And so this is your this is your main landing page for each of your sites. And you'll see that it shows your different environments. So in this scenario, again, we have a development, uh, a staging, and a production. The staging here is a little lower on the page. And again, if you need two developments, if you need multiple sets of staging. Um, we can support that, but obviously um, the normal scenario is development, staging, and production. I will make one other net mention, and that is that we have some customers who want to have their development and staging on the same box, and we, we can do that. So this doesn't necessarily mean um, that this is multiple machines. There's not a machine per environment. It, it, it can, uh, we have one customer, for example, who has dev, staging, and production, and their database all on a single machine. Not my recommendation, but that's, that's what that customer wanted. Um, all right, so you can see also that there's a link to preview the site, and um, 
I'll go ahead and click, for example, on the development one, and you can see that I have a Drupal 8 install here. And um, I can also show you that this is the production, um, etc. So I can show you, I can essentially click on these links, and it goes directly to, to the site, to that version of the site. So for this demo, I'm going to go ahead and go, for example, to the production, and I'm going to make a change. I went ahead in this demo to um, set the permissions so that anonymous users can um, add content just so they don't have to worry about logging in and logging out. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and create an article. And, of course, we're going to do the Hello World, because we always do. And we're going to save and publish this. And so... Um, here in our production environment, we can see that we have data. Um, hello world. I'll go back to the home page so you can see that article. And if we go back to our staging environment, you'll notice it just says, welcome to Black Mesh. It doesn't have that, that hello world content. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a deploy of our database from the production environment down to our staging environment so that you can see the changes. So here at the um, at the bottom of each of the uh, environments, you see the, the workflows. Um, again, through permissions, we can remove some of these workflows. You probably, after you, like I said earlier, if, after you go live, you don't want to have a workflow of sending your staging database to your um, to production. Um, but for this example, I'll go ahead and take our database from production, and I'll deploy it down to staging. And I'm going to click the button. It's going to say, "Are you sure?" Um, Hopefully you, you um, do a sanity check and select OK. And down here in the workflow log, you'll see that this is currently in progress. And I can click on this and see what it's actually doing and follow the steps. And if you know anything about Jenkins, Jenkins essentially runs scripts. Scripts can have output. We're essentially taking that output and pulling it all the way up into the interface. A couple things to note about this. Um, first of all, it's backing, it's making a backup of both the destination and the source databases. This means that if you need a rollback, you can. Um, it, we don't have a rollback mechanism in the interface, um, but that's why we have a support team. Um, the support team can, um, you know, you put a support request in and we'll get that um, restored as quickly as possible. Um, obviously, this is a base Drupal 8 install. It only took uh, 37 seconds for this to happen. Obviously, Databases get much larger than that. This is also on a vagrant box, so there's no um, there's no real network um, issues to, to be worried about. But I'll go ahead and show you. This was our staging, and if I hit shift refresh and everything worked, I should see hello world. So our database has successfully has successfully moved from production down to staging, and I won't um, go through that whole process and make you wait for it. But I'm going to go ahead and get started on a deploy um, on, in the staging environment down to development. And I'll come back in a few minutes and show you that that has also happened. OK, so obviously um, the other piece of the puzzle is code, right? That's the, that's the thing that's, that's more interesting. So instead of editing Drupal's settings.ph, oh, no, sorry, um, uh, index.php and doing something weird, I decided to do something else weird. Um, <laughs> I created a simple ASCII file that has the Drupal logo in it. Um, actually, I didn't create the logo, so I, I will say that I just copied that off the internet. Um, I should have put the uh, attribution there. But anyway, you can see it's in the root folder, and I have two versions of this, so I can push this through the paces. Um, I've created little links here just so I can save you time me typing these. But essentially, you can see that the dev and the staging and the production all have the ASCII version of that. So on another screen here, hopefully you can see this. Um, yeah, hopefully we can see this. I have my, my code checked out. Now, to tell you where to, you could have gotten this, um, sorry about that. There we go. We have a little button here that shows you how you can do a git clone. I mean, obviously, we all know how to do a git clone. Just showing you this, this gives you the URL so that you can easily do it. And again, it looks a little bit uh, strange in, um, in this compressed interface. Okay, 
So I've already done the git clone. Here's my code. If I do a cat on, um, on ASCII, you can see, well, it doesn't look very good. But that's, that was the uh, code for the simple version. I have this magnified so the people in the back can see it, so that's why we're not seeing it as well. But I have another version here. I have an ASCII 2 version. So I'm going to um, cat the ASCII 2 version into the ASCII version. And um, I should do that correctly. There we go. And I've just made a change. I can do a git status. And this is just obviously just git commands. I can see that my ASCII.html has changed. I git add, git commit, git push origin. Now, to talk about branching, we associate a branch with each environment. So you have, um, you have dev staging and production, we create three branches, bmesh dev, bmesh staging, and bmesh production. What this means is that if you have a hot fix that needs to go live, you can check out the staging branch, then do a push into the staging branch and go directly to staging and skip your development um, stage. Uh, obviously, that's not recommended for most uh, situations, but we're, we said hotfix, right? So in this scenario, you've already made a bunch of changes. It's already on dev. Instead of um, taking that everything live that was already on dev, you can go directly to staging. Let's take an even a more extreme scenario. So you've already, you have stuff on dev. You already have stuff on staging. You're about to go live. Then you need to do the hotfix. Yes, you can also pull out just the production branch and go directly to production if you... Uh, um, if you so desire. Again, not recommended, but um, again, it's a hot fix. So in this scenario, BMesh dev is our dev branch, and so we're going to push to that. And if everything works correctly, and it did earlier today, um, within a few seconds, our dev box is going to update. So again, there is the old, here is your new. So this code has already checked out, and it's just a little bit different of a logo show you that it did not deploy that change to everywhere. I can refresh my staging and my production and show you that staging and production is still the old code. Back in the interface, I can now deploy this code to from bmesh dev to bmesh staging. So we're taking we're essentially doing a merge between the branches. If we've done git before we know what a merge is. We do a merge and then we do a checkout. This this does imply that it's important when um, you do a hot fix that you make sure you merge those changes also down into the lower branches. So the deploy has been done. Again we can watch what is happening and um, and why this while this happens um, I'll note again that this is this is live. Um, in the background, I talked about this concept of Jenkins or this application Jenkins that's sitting in the background. I won't go into this in detail except to say that again you can you can plug into this. So let's say you wanted to run a testing suite every time um, every every time you push to dev, uh, go right ahead and do that. Let's say you wanted to uh, also push the code out to um, uh, to Bitbucket or some other repo, maybe GitHub, so you wanted to re run Travis or something like that, uh, you can hook into that, uh, create notifications, etc. Um, let's see, where are we in the process? Okay, so it found the branches, it created the merge request, it accepted the merge request, it found, and what it does is it goes to dev staging and production at this time and says, are you, um, are you the latest version of the code? And if not, it checks it out. So at this point, I should be able to go to staging, hit a shift refresh, and we'll see that staging has now been updated. Development should not have changed. Production is still there. And I will go ahead at this point and get a deploy to production started. I uh, won't make you wait for it. Um, but in this scenario, we, again, are taking our code now from staging to production. Um, I mentioned uh, LDAP is sitting behind this. So again, permissions are granular. So for both GitLab, um, for Jenkins, and for Cascade, all three pieces, you can um, you are giving essentially a master account, and you can use that account to divvy out permissions as necessary. Um, again, you don't want after you go on live someone pushing uh, staging to production. 
And that essentially concludes the demo. This will be finished in just a couple seconds. But while that continues, um, are there any questions? Yes, sir. So um, Jenkins is calling an Ansible wrapper that we've built, and that is what's doing the deployments. So that is essentially logging into dev, doing the git clone, or the git checkout, or the git pull, and then it logs back out of the machine. It's also the thing that's doing the database dumps, for example. So it logs in to, um, Ansible knows how to log into machines and knows how to do commands. So it logs, for example, into your production database, has a database dump, executes an R sync over to the new machine, um, logs out, logs into the new machine, does an import. Why not, uh, why not just rely on changing the Oh, we could have. Uh, but in this scenario, we had other things that um, we wanted to do with, um, with uh, yeah, there's pieces. some there's some other pieces yeah. to it that we're doing that um, to ensure machine state. So where that's what not Jenkins doesn't do that, right? And, I mean, and also, we could write stuff to do that, but at the yeah. end of the day, it's not what's meant for. And also, you know, that would require us to create Jenkins templates, and then people. Customers could jump in and modify the templates and muck themselves up, and now we're forced to go and fix that. So it meant, um, from our perspective, that just making making a wrapper do that is the best route. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So is this a uh, is this operating service, a product, or some combination? Yeah. yeah. So this is a, a service that Blackmesh offers. Okay. So um, we give this basically we we sell this as part of our stuff. Um, much like you get anywhere else. Um, the, the main difference between this and others is that this is dedicated to you. This is not multi-tenant, this is single tenant. Um, it is single tenant to you from the perspective of, that's why we can allow you to plug into Jenkins. You have access to this stuff. You have access to GitLab. You have access to do all these hooks and all these different changes that is completely for you. So it's not like we're trying to do one big deployment and everybody has to fit in this deployment in this window. And there, that said, there was, there was a lot of um, stuff that we did with Ansible that we have made open source. If you check us out on GitHub forward slash black mesh, we did put as much as we could up there. So there's a lot of stuff. There was another question? I don't know if we have the time to show an example of what kind of error handling is there. If somebody does that hot fix in production and doesn't do it again, uh, does that get caught? Okay, so our recommendation when you do a hot fix is um, to go ahead and do a merge back from production down to staging and staging down to dev. You can do that through the interface, or you can do that through, um, uh, you know, get a get checkout, or get clone. Um, I will say that um, the interface will give you errors. So I showed, essentially, um, in this scenario, everything was green, right? So if this had been an error, it would turn red, and when you clicked it, you would essentially see exactly what happened. Um, and we've, we've run into the very scenario that you've, you've mentioned. And it, it'll essentially say in this scenario that the merge failed because there was conflicts. And it gives the link actually into GitLab where you can see all your pushes, just like GitHub has, um, has a list that you can go into here and they'll see all your pushes. But also you can go in and look at your merge request. And you can actually look at the very merge request that failed and get your diff and see exactly why. Um, you can't resolve it through the interface. That still is going to require you to do code changes and do pushes. But yes, you, you, have, the, you have the tools to figure out why. And, and to be clear, like how we delineate what we do and what you do as a developer is that you know your code, right? And we're, we're expecting you to know Git and how to use Git. Um, we expect you to know how to read Jenkins jobs and stuff like that. But what we're doing is we're basically putting that wrapper around it to make it look nice, right? So that you don't have to know, you have to manually go and type all those commands all the time, every time, that you want to basically push a change or push a hotfix in. And that's, you know, at the end of the day, we're system administrators that know how to how, how code works. We're not developers, and that's where we say, that's the delineation on the line. It's a very fine line, and it's hard to go on one side or the other, but we try to stay on that line as much as we can. And when it comes to Jenkins, you don't actually have to know Jenkins unless you want to. So I mean, he's right. You have to know Jenkins if you want to do more with Jenkins. But just out of, out of the gate, no, you don't have to know anything about Jenkins. In fact, if you don't want the login, we won't give it to you. Just 
Uh, it is no, because it's SSH, right? So I mean, as long as there's SSH there, it's similar to a Beanstalk service, right? I mean, you can use Beanstalk to do anything anywhere, right? So what we what we've made as a policy is that you, ha if you have services with us and we give you this this platform to use that with our services, um, we'll work with you if you have services el elsewhere to basically integrate with those as well. Awesome. Yep. Any other questions? Awesome. If you want to, if you want another demo or a more closer look at this, um, come down to our booth. We're pretty much at the front. Come find us. One of us will be able to talk to you at least a little more in depth. If you want to see something in particular, you know, maybe how, how we've entered, you know, how, how some of these GitLab things are happening or, you know, things of that nature, you know, we're more than happy to talk about it. Thank you. Thanks.